helping your child cope with work. <coughs> I'm Carrie Sorrentino, and I'm the public health nurse here on the board on uh, behalf of the Chelmsford Board of Health, sponsoring the program. Tonight, we have Dr. Susan O'Brien. She's the Parker Middle School psychologist, and she's joining us for our presentation. Dr. O'Brien earned her doctorate in clinical child psychology <coughs> from Penn State, and she completed her postdoctoral fellowship in developmental neuropsychology at North Shore Children's Hospital. Dr. O'Brien has worked with the Chelmsford, Chelmsford Public School System since 1994, and she has a small private practice up on North Shore. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. O'Brien. <laughs> well, welcome to Tuesday at the library. This is um, quite a surprising little turnout here. I made 30 uh, handouts, and they went to go make more, um, which says something about the uh, epidemic of anxiety in our, in our society today and in our kids. Um, how many of you think you might have an anxious kid at home? How many of yourselves might be anxious? <laughs> okay. <laughs> we do tend to find that anxiety begets anxiety. Um, and we'll talk about anxiety tonight from a, um, a two-pronged approach, um, the mind and the body, because um, those as you all probably have heard all over the media for the last 15 years or so, the you know, mind and body go hand in hand. And I'll be talking about children in general. I mean, some of you probably have four-year-olds and some of you might have 17-year-olds. And um, I'm going to talk about the concepts in general. Um, I will recommend a few resources at the end for you that you know, look more specifically at kids versus teens. Um, and as I mentioned before, I have a, a little handout to emphasize a few of the points that uh, I'll be making tonight. Um, when we think about anxious kids, you just think about people whose little bodies are in high alert all the time. Um, they have a, a system that is kind of exaggerating threat and exaggerating danger and overreacting to it. They can't, they can't think through it to see what really is going on. Um, so they're, it's like their default setting is high alert. And there are times in life when being on high alert is good, right? If you're a firefighter, or if you're home and you smell smoke, um, if you see a big fin in the water at Nosset Beach, right? There are times when it's appropriate to be on high alert, but there are many times when it's not, and it's actually detrimental to kids. Um, so this function of, of being ready for the fight or flight or freeze um, response is something that's protective for us when it's used appropriately, but it gets in our way and it, help, and it makes us function maladaptively when it's not an appropriate time. And so for kids who are anxious, it happens because they're in a situation where they can't predict the outcome or they can't um, be guaranteed the outcome is going to be a good one for them. And most kids have a pretty good predictor system, an evaluator system. But when you have an anxious kid, things are a little bit out of whack. Um, so for them, they are more likely to see catastrophe where another kid might see a mild threat, or they see a threat period where someone else sees something as ambiguous. Um, and anxiety gets to the point where it's a, there's a, uh, oh no, it's taken now, <laughs> sorry. Um, anxiety gets to be an anxiety disorder when the kid is automatically exaggerating the risk and underestimating their ability to cope with it. So it's a two-pronged thing, okay? There are, you know, you'll meet people who, um, like, like the guy who free climbs up those rocks, right? It, all over the, whatever his name is. Remember his name? Free yeah, Free Solo guy, right? So he, he evaluates that, but he is so competent in his abilities that he's willing to do it. But when you ha are ex exaggerating a risk and you're underestimating your competence to handle it, is when you get anxious. And when you are anxious in a perpetual state, it leads to all kinds of problems <laughs> in terms of your socialization and your academic functioning um, and your health, right? So these are the kind of things that we, we need to address in kids. Now, in kids who are anxious have many faces. Um, you know, some of you may have the verbally anxious child. Anybody have a kid who's like, da, 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 da. right? <laughs> right, they're the kids who, they have all these worries. They tell you about all their worries all the time. Sometimes you're, you're tired of hearing about their worries. Uh, you try to be patient. Um, but
but they're always thinking and they're always verbalizing. So those are like the verbally anxious kids. And then you have kids that we refer to as kind of undercover <coughs> anxious. They look fine on the outside. Does anybody have any of those where your teacher will say, he's not anxious, what do you mean, he's fine. Um, and they're the kids who are very good at internalizing it and hiding it and putting on a good face and the world thinks they're fine and inside they're a mess. And, you know, and it's, it's easy to miss it because they are very, they're very good at it. But they may get home to you and fall apart. Or they may look fine for a while and then one little thing happens and they fall apart. And then we have kids who are the um, somaticizers. You know what that means? It all comes out in their body. So you may have kids who have headaches and stomach aches. Um, <coughs> you know, they have all kinds of GI distress. They complain about their body temperature. They just they complain about aches and pains. I mean, you know, I, working in the middle school, I close friends with the nurse, and there, there are you know some kids who come to the nurse five times in four years, and there's some kind, kids who come to the nurse 22 times in a month, <laughs> and you know, <laughs> that's and that's an example of the anxiety coming out in their body. We also have kids who are angry, anxious. I don't know if any of you have those. They're pretty unpleasant. <laughs> They're hard to be around because they have a lot of underlying anxiety and it comes out in irritability and anger because they, they have this discomfort and instead of being an internalizer, they're a kid who is going to kind of lash out and be really irritable and be really cranky. Um, and then we have kids who are avoiders and the avoiders are the kids who are like, I'm fine, I just, you know, I, I don't like birthday parties. I don't want to go to that. It's, I don't. No, I don't want to join a team. I'd rather just, you know, play on my iPad. So they may be really truly anxious about that, but they cope with it just by keeping their world very small. And part of the problem with that is that the kids' worlds tend to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and that's very, very concerning. So, excuse me. Um, now, how do you get to have an anxious kid? Anybody have any theories on this? Have you heard about any? You know, so anxious genes? Anxious. Yeah, you are anxious, right? So, you know, there definitely, there is a genetic component, but it counts for maybe 30 or 40% of the variability. And so what that means is that there are definitely some anxious people who have kids who aren't anxious, and there are definitely some anxious kids who don't have anxious parents. So it's not like, it's not like, you know, brown eyes. Um, it's, it's more complicated than that. There are a lot of factors with temperament, um, and how, how your body processes information. Um, now, I had this wonderful poster I wrote here to show you, which I left on my office wall. So I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to, um, can you come here for a sec? I'm going to have to do a little, uh, little modeling about what happens with the, um, this is my daughter, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so this is, doing, so I, I should, I, yeah, I didn't plan this. Um, so, you know, we all, we all have our beautiful brain in here and there's different, you know, I'm sure you've heard different parts of the brain and many have many different names. But down here we have like the lower brain and the upper brain, that's ways you've heard it divided. Um, and we have the limbic system or the cortex, another way of describing it. But in here, in the lower brain, is where we have the amygdala. <laughs> Her amygdala is beautiful. Um, so the, the amygdala is this little processor, and that's what, where information comes first from your sensory world. And it assesses it to, you know, for what we're gonna do with it next. And in anxious individuals, the amygdala is what gets overly activated, and it sees things as um, dangerous, scary, not to be trusted, uh, and when, and norm, when things are working well, stuff goes into your, through your senses, into your amygdala, and is, is passed on to your cortex where you think about it, and you plan, and you make your decisions, and you respond. But what happens is that if your amygdala is overly active, stuff never gets up there, okay? You know that experience of like, I just froze up, I couldn't think straight? You know, you were anxious about something and you couldn't think of a word or you couldn't, you couldn't answer on a test. That's what's happening. The, your amygdala is like so out of control that it's stopping your, uh, your, your cortex from thinking. And there seems to be, um, you seem to come in the world, come into the world with a certain amount of ratio of how, of, of how active your amygdala is. 
Thank you, Maida. You're done. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, where'd I go with that? Oh, I wanted to give you a little anecdote, which I thought was really interesting. It's not an anecdote, but it's more of like a um, little bit of piece of research in that there's a, a famous pediatrician called Jerome Kagan. And um, he did studies on babies, toddlers, you know, 20, 18, 21 months old, and looked at their response to novel stimuli. So they had these little babies, and they put into their environment something new, not something scary, just something new, a new toy, a new sippy cup, or a new mobile hanging over their head. 15%, most of the kids, 85% of the kids responded with like, oh, cool, delight, curiosity, looking happy. 15% were distressed, but it's because there was something new in their environment, okay? So, so they processed something new as scary, as novel, as opposed to being intrigued by it. And of those kids, when they followed them into childhood, half of them had a social anxiety disorder by the time they were, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten years old. So there is something that, you know, of how you come into the world which predisposes you to this uh, kind of thing. Uh, there are also environmental factors, not surprisingly. I think everybody probably knows that kids who have been through trauma have a much more, have a much higher ratio of, of um, depression and anxiety. And the trauma can be a discrete trauma, like, you know, living through Hurricane Katrina, or it could be ongoing um, abuse. Um, it could be even having a chronic medical illness. You know, kids who have cystic fibrosis, who have had childhood cancer, those are all kind of traumatic experiences. So those kids are um, definitely all at risk for developing mental health issues. Um, there are things about family and parenting styles that can enhance anxious responding, I would say. Um, there's not, it's not like there's clear cut fabulous data on it, but in general, I would say that, you know, a parenting style of being kind of overprotective and over controlling, um, not fostering autonomy, independence, clearly what you would foster at age five is different than 17, but if you think about what typical families and peers are doing, and then families that are um, less likely to grant autonomy and independence and to be trusting of your kid being able to handle things, it tends to give the, the child a message that, well, maybe I'm not safe in the world. Maybe I can handle these things. Maybe I, I do need to be more careful and be more cautious. Um, and along those lines, um, a lot of conflict around children is, is, is not good for them and does create more anxiety even if the conflict isn't directly involving them. So if you're, if you're living in a house with tremendous conflict be between parents or between you know, a difficult teenager and the parents, and it's very, and there's a lot, of, a lot of yelling and screaming and discord all the time, what that's doing is it's, it's, it's raising in the child, their amygdala is on alert way more than it should be <laughs> on a regular basis. So those kids are more prone to develop anxiety disorders. Um, so in terms of like your own kid, you know, when you should worry, um, you know, if you feel regularly like your kid's response to things is out of proportion, I mean, everybody's, every kid's going to have a day when they're more anxious um, than others or not have a good response sometimes. But if you feel like consistently your kid is um, over, overreacting to, to things that are going on in their world, um, if you feel like you can't reassure your kid with logical explanations, you know, like, most kids, if I tell them this, they'd be like, I'm okay, okay, that's good. And you feel like you're being rational with your kid and calm and logical and, and they, they're not reassured by that. Um, are they having a lot of physical symptoms? You know, like the, like the headaches and the stomach aches and um, sleep disturbance, they can't fall asleep or they're waking up in the middle of the night, can't fall back asleep. Um, are you having to spend a lot of time to get things to work right in your family? Having to you know, change plans so they're, they're willing to take part in it. Um, convincing them, preparing them, cajoling them to doing things that you don't have to with your other kids. Um, and has this gone on for a period of time? You know, there, are, there are times when you're gonna have a transient anxiety period, but if it's you know, going on for five, six months, then it's time to be concerned. And does the anxiety lead to avoidance regularly. So there are there things that you think your kid should be doing, would enjoy, and they're not doing it because of, of most likely because of anxiety. So that would be a concern. In terms of helping your family to cope, cope with, with anxiety, 
there's um, several things I think are important to do. And just as like I'm educating you now about this stuff, it's important to educate your child about it because they're in this. <laughs> and you know, it's your kid. Your ki kids know when their responses are different than their peers, and when attention is being called to them for their reticence to engage in things. And sometimes you can't help it. Sometimes people get frustrated with them. Come on, just get in the pool. That's kind of after a while. That's you know you're going to lose your patience. Teachers will lose their patience if they have 24 kids. And they're trying to get them all you know outside to write um, an observation of the leaves turning colors in the fall, and one kid is afraid to go outside because of bugs. Eventually, the teachers going to get frustrated. <laughs> so when those kind of things are, um, so that help a kid knows then that they are different. From, from their peers. And I think it's, it's helpful to educate them about the things that I was talking about. And you can do that in very child-friendly language. Um, an older kid, clearly, you could, and I did put a little information about that in the packet, about the amygdala and all that stuff. Um, clearly, an older kid, you can have that kind of clear discussion with about the, the parts of the brain and how they process information. And you know, you seem to have a system where the worry portion is disproportionately in control as opposed to the thinking portion. But kids, kids love little, um, little other ways of talking about it. So sometimes with, with children, you can call, you can refer to it as having two parts of their brain. So you have your protector brain, which is the part that has the flight or fright, um, fight, flight or freeze reaction. Um, and then your other part you can call your thinking brain, or you can call it your, um, your worry mind and your wise mind. You, you know, whatever kind of works for you and your family. But I think that if you help, help the ch it's important to help the child see that this isn't just all of who they are. You know, you, you know I'm not, I am not just worry. I am a kid, and the worry is, there is worry that's in the way of me doing what I need to do in life. And we need to figure out what to do with that worry and helping them understand that um, it's how their brain is thinking about information, if their brain is tricking them, can be really, can be really helpful to that. Uh, so, so I think it's an important thing to do with, with kids of all ages. Um, and I think it's, it's also important along those lines to explain to them about the misinterpretation. Um, you, and you can use the terms like false alarms or brain mistakes. Like your brain makes mistakes sometimes on a math problem or on a spelling test. Your brain is sometimes can make a, make a mistake about what there is to be worried about. You know, if I if I play soccer on Saturday, I'm going to break my ankle. Okay, now that's maybe somebody broke their ankle last year on their team, but their brain is making a mistake. And those are the kind of things that you can talk about about. About their child, about your child um, having trouble interpreting the accuracy of what's really likely to happen. Um, so their first reaction may be this worried reaction, but their second thoughtful reaction can be a different one. Um, so we're going to talk about the parts of the brain, introduce the concept of brain mistakes to kids or false alarms, and you can even, you know, I think. It can be helpful even to give a perspective from evolution. You know, like when prehistoric men were roaming the earth, right, what you had to be afraid of was things coming to get you all the time, right? So having an amygdala that was really strong was really important because you might be gobbled up by a tiger at a moment's notice. Um, and that's no longer the case. So now what we need to do is be able to assess a situation validly. Um, and the, another part of what we should talk about with kids is helping them know that we're going to help them take charge of their worries. Okay, that you don't have to always. You know, there there are there are things that we can do to help you think better about this, and uh, to let your wise mind have more control over your worried mind. And another aspect of that is that we want to let the child know that when 
when you continue to respond in a worried, anxious way over time, those pathways of your brain are getting more practice. That's a nice way of describing it to kids. And we need to start thinking more rationally about things. We need to exercise the thinking muscles in your brain, the ones that can evaluate things more accurately. Because the more we, if we don't practice with those, the worry muscles are going to get stronger. And it'll be harder and harder to be able to think more clearly about things. Um, so in terms of a couple of ways of different tactics of using with kids, first of all, any questions so far? Okay. Um, and we can try to we can try to help kids visualize this, and you can you know you can do it with a paper and pen or a whiteboard or um, whatever you might like. But you can help help a kid see that when information comes in, they can think about it as a train, and they can either get onto the worry track or onto the truth track. Okay, and you can make you know little boxes where um, I guess the example of the soccer game. You know, so I have a soccer game on Saturday. I'm supposed to start playing soccer on Saturday. Yikes, I might break my ankle. So the, you know, the worry track is that um, I'm going to get in the field, some threads, I'm going to break my ankle. So because of that, I feel really nervous. And because of that, I don't want to play soccer. I'm not going. So that's the worry track. And you have to engage the child into, well, let's, let's look at the truth track. Let's think about that. And one thing that's really important with this kind of approach is that just talking at your kid, you know, like how many times have you tried to reassure them, don't worry about that, it'll be fine. It, it doesn't really work, right? Because they just, they maintain, you know, it's like it's right over their head, right? So, but what you want to do is you want to, when you engage, their, engage them in thinking, when you're asking them questions, you are making the thinking brain work which automatically makes the worry brain less effective, okay? So you're not, you're not, gonna, at, not gonna tell them, it's gonna be fine, don't worry, get in the car. You're going to say, well, you know, what are you thinking might happen? Who have you known who's played soccer? How many, how, many, how many kids do you think in your school play soccer? How many times have you seen somebody break their ankle? What's the likelihood that you're going to break their ankle? So when you're engaged in this thinking process, you are, you are making the cortical function of the brain engaged as opposed to um, the limbic system. So that's like, you know, the, um, that's like the brain train, okay? So you can do that with a kid, the, the worry track, what is, what is the worried thought, what is your feeling because of that, and what's gonna be the outcome? And then the truth track would be processing with them um, a more realistic expectation, how they're gonna feel then, which would be I might be nervous, but I'm going to be happy that I'm playing, and I'm going to want to go to soccer on Saturday. So that's, that's one of the little um, ways that you can do that. Um, with older kids, you can just talk about the stories. You know, this is, OK, that's your worry story. Let's sit down together and talk about what's the realistic story, what's the probable story, whatever kind of phrasing works for you. Um, I mean, older kids may be more visual. Some of you are going to be more visual, too. But a lot of times with the older kids, you can just have those key phrases. And once again, the more you exercise that thinking rational part of the brain, the less engaged the limbic system is going to be, the amygdala, the worried brain, the protector brain. <laughs> um, so I think that's a, um, those are some, you can, in your family, have some key phrases like that that you use. Um, like, that was, okay, that was your first thought. Let's take a step back. Can we, let's, what, what might be your second thought? You know, because their first response will be the anxious one. What might be your second thought? Um, that was your protector brain talking. What is your smart brain saying? So, and kids, they really, they really love this stuff. We, we do it all the time. <laughs> and uh, it, it makes them feel kind of, uh, a little empowered when you're asking them these questions about, about their own feelings. Um, you also want to fight with them um, all or none thinking. Do you see that in your kids sometimes? Like, you know, it's, it's not going to be okay, it's going to be terrible, it's going to be catastrophe, yada, yada. So uh, sometimes when there's any risk at all, an anxious kid sees it as a huge risk. So. You need to, it helps to process with them, even if you draw diagrams. Okay, so this is all the things that could happen, and 
this is what could happen, that would be really terrible, right? So, and getting a kid to the point where they can tolerate, yeah, there's a risk, but there's a, it's a small risk, and I'm probably going to be okay. It's a really important thing. Um, let's see. And along those same lines, it helps to te teach the kids the concept of outcome and likelihood. Okay, so um, there are things we think about that are terrible outcomes, like you know, 9/11, terrorists on the plane, crashing, thousands of people killed. That is a horrible outcome. But the, still, the likelihood of something bad happening when you get on a plane is practically infinitesimal, right? It means a very, very low risk of something will happen. But research shows that, in general, people think to, tend to think more about outcomes than probability. So that's a, those are good things to, to talk about with your kid. OK, well now that's a, what is, there's a risk there. How great a risk is that? What's the outcome likely to be? And along those lines, one thing that can be helpful is to sometimes use a discussion like, um, let's pretend this is a million dollar question, OK? I'm gonna, if you were to get a million dollars, if you predicted correctly what was going to happen on a Friday, you say, I can't pass that math test. If you had to predict, I'm going to pass it or I'm not going to pass it, if you were win a million dollars for being correct, which one would you pick? Because very often, in their heart of hearts, they know, OK? <laughs> and uh, along those lines, too, questions such as, OK, let's, just, let's not think about soccer game on Saturday. Let's picture next week. What do you picture? If you think yourself next Wednesday, do you picture yourself having been to soccer and being OK after soccer? Or do you picture yourself really having been in the hospital? And a lot of times, they can, they can work with you, and they can really make a good assessment. Um, and by the same token, we need to, with many kids, um, they do a lot of what ifs, and they go off and off into the future. Have you ever had a kid who's like, you know, um, they're 13, and they're talking about, oh my god, I'm not going to get an A on this test, and then I'm not going to get into honors for next year, and then I'm not going to get into college I want to go to. It's like, oh my god, you know, you're, you're four years down the road. So it's really, it's really important with the kids to think, to let them know about there are many steps between here and there. What is the first step to getting there? The first step to getting there is to study for your test on Friday. <laughs> and to keep, to snap them back from the future into the present. Keep them into what they need to do now. And help them make those concrete goals. OK, what do I do? We want to make sure, what, and what can you do? What can you do? Once again, you're asking them, what can you do to um, help get a good outcome on Friday? Well, I go to class. I already do that. And I take notes. I already do that. Um, I can practice the problems, okay, and I'll study for the test, okay. You help them see what they can do to take control of their world. Um, all right, um, and an, another little, almost like a game that you can do with kids um, is to help them sort through their brain mail. These are all different ways of helping them see exaggerated worry from reality, you know, so, um, I mean, what percentage of your mail is junk mail? Right? And what percentage of your email is junk mail? So you can even illustrate that to the kid that, you know, this is the mail that came in today. And I have to figure out what I have to pay attention to. This I know is junk mail. This I know is real mail. This I have to assess. Sometimes they're tricky. You have to open it up and see if it's really something you need. Um, same thing with, it's marked urgent. It's not really urgent. <laughs> um, and then, same thing with your email. I mean, you have a spam folder because the computer knows that some things are just junk. Other things come through, they look like they might be real, but they are junk too. And that's, that's kind of a concept that kids can, um, can, kids can hang on to. So you can think about your thoughts coming into your head as mail. And you have to sort the mail into the worry mail or the truth mail. And, and, and I think you can keep like a notebook even as to, so they can have more practice with this. And even you can do it in the moment or at the end of the day. Remember when this happened at, you told me you had a hard time at recess because you were afraid, you know, you don't want to play four square because you were afraid the kids were going to, um, you know, not be nice to you. And you can, you can use your, you know, your worry mail and your truth mail to think, okay, what were your thoughts about that? What's realistic? What would happen if a kid was mean to you? 
That's a big, it's a big thing too, I think. Sometimes we're so afraid of our kids having any distress. And that's part of life. You know, it's, it's being able to get through the distress is what's really important. Okay, so if someone did say something mean to you, what would happen then? I would feel, yep, you might feel sad for a few minutes. What if they said a really bad word? You know, I could tell Mr. So-and-so. You know, and you can help them see that even if something bad were to happen, it, it's not, it's such a catastrophe that you couldn't, you couldn't handle it. And that's a really important thing to let kids know that they can handle it. Um, all right. That one. Okay. Sometimes, too, if, if kids have active imaginations, you know, like they have, um, I know they're, they're pretty good at you know, characters or they have you know, sports heroes they love. You can also enlist like this imaginary um, possibility panel, you know, like, oh my God, I can't, I can't go to, to baseball because what if I strike out and then, you know, I'm going to be humiliated and like, I'm never going to be able to play again. And, you know, it's like, and you can, okay, let's think about who, who would you get baseball advice from? Well, Andrew Benintendi. Okay, and you know, what's his batting average? You know, well, 310, you know, and how many times is, okay, so what does that mean? How many times does he get a hit? Does he not get a hit? Do you think that he's not gonna play if he doesn't get a hit? Those are the kind of things that you can use, like, with people that they um, admire in, in their world. Um, you can also do that in real life, you know, like the math test. If a kid is like, oh my God, I'm not gonna be able to pass the math test. And this is a kid who's always had A's and B's, right? They're probably gonna pass the math test. You know what, why don't you write an email to your teacher? We'll sit down together. I'm afraid I'm gonna fail on Friday. What do you think about that, Mrs. Smith? And Mrs. Smith's gonna say, uh, you have an 89 average and you've done all your homework and you're paying attention to class, I think you're gonna pass. And those are the kind of things that can be helpful to them to have an outside source because you know they never listen to you, right? Like they listen to somebody else, so well, that's always important. Um, and another concept that can be helpful is um, trying to enlist the other parts of themselves. So, you know, they, they're invited to a sleepover for Saturday and like, I don't want to go, I'm nervous, I'm nervous, I'm nervous. Okay, well, part of you is nervous, right? What other parts of you are there? What? Uh, well, are, is part of you maybe excited? Well, maybe. What are they gonna do there? Oh, we're gonna do Dance's Revolution and we're gonna have pizza. Okay, so that might be a good part. Um, so you can kind of enlist them to think about their experiences in parts. That's, once again, these anxious kids are all or none but you need to help them foster, into, to foster their thinking about the different facets of themselves and their experiences. So that's a good phrase. Well, part of you is nervous, part of you is worried, or part of you is anxious. What other parts are there? Is, is there a part that is excited? Is there a part that's curious? I don't know what we're gonna do. She won't tell what we're gonna do at the party. I'm like, oh, so that's kind of, that's kind of exciting, right? Um, so those are something that you can do with kids. And, um, the other thing, too, is a lot, of, a lot of anxious kids often always want an answer, like a yes or no, like, you know, like the black and white thinking, you know, are you ever going to die? Um, am, am I, am I going to get to go to Ivy League College? Uh, they have all these questions, and I think it's important to get them comfortable with ambiguity and to let them know, no, don't try to answer them if you can't. <coughs> Let them know that you know there are things that I would like to know that I can always can't get the answer to. And I, I will promise you that if I know the answer to something, I will give you the answer. But I can't promise you that. I am, I'm healthy, I feel good, daddy's healthy. I don't think anything bad's gonna happen to us anytime soon. And that's the best I can do for you now. Because getting a kid comfortable with a little bit of ambiguity is an important part of life. You have to deal with it every day, right? So it's good for them to have to cope with that as well. And when they have a problem, um, you also want to get them, it can help to break things down. And sometimes they won't tell you that first time out, like I don't want to go to the sleepover. And you want to talk at them and see if, and engage them. What, when you think of sleepover, what do you think of? And then you might find out that there's one little thing that is in the way of them going to the sleepover. A fear that they're going to get sick in the middle of the night and not know what to do. Right? Or fear that they're going to have to pee in the middle of the night and not know where to go. So it's really helpful if you, if you talk through with them, because once again, they have their amygdalas overcharged and they think, I can't go to the sleepover. And they're not able to break it down into what are the things that might get in their way. And you can work out a plan. You know, if you got sick in the middle of the night, what would you do? Well, I don't know. Who could you tell? 
Well, I'll be sleeping next to Betty. Okay, you can tell Betty. And what's Betty going to do? Well, she can tell her mom. Okay, you can help them see that there is a logical and safe conclusion to those, to those things. All right. Now, those are all the cognitive parts of what goes on in worry and, and things that you can do to help with it. Um, but for many children, there's a whole som somatic, a whole body-related part to the anxiety. Um, you know, there are, there are some kids who it seems to be all cognitive and they don't really have any physical problems. There are some kids who it starts in their mind and they start to have some physical symptoms and they know. They, they know that, you know, my stomach is upset because I'm worried about the dance on Friday. Um, my head is killing me because I, I, I'm, I'm afraid about the, um, the science midterm on, on Tuesday. There are even some other kids for whom it goes right to the body and they are not aware consciously of any anxiety, which sounds hard to imagine, but it absolutely happens. We will have kids who have terrible um, headaches. It's actually, I find it more often GI stuff, <laughs> uh, whether it's you know just stomach aches or um, diarrhea, uh, and they have, they're not aware of it being anxiety. They don't have conscious, anxious thoughts but their body is, is a mess. So there are things that we have to do to kind of um, help them be in a calmer physical state. Um, so th that last group of kids are the somaticizers. Um, now, it helps kids, when that happens to a kid, like if a kid starts to have panic symptoms, say they're having, their heart is racing or they're having a terrible stomach ache um, or they're feeling like they can't catch their breath, that's scary, right? I mean, if, anybody, if you've ever had a panic attack, it's terrifying. You really think you're gonna die. It's like a classic symptom that people feel like they're gonna die when they have a panic That's how they end up in the ER thinking that, that they're having a heart attack. Um, so when kids start to have significant anxiety symptoms, it's scary, and then it's this vicious circle, right? Because the body's telling them they should be scared, so their head is more scared, and it makes their body worse, and it's, and it's, um, it's very difficult to cope with. Um, so one thing that can be helpful with kids is to help explain to them, you know, where these body, these body symptoms come from in, in, in the big picture. Um, and, and this all comes back to the, the, the amygdala and responding to threat. Because when there was real threat in the world, the heart races. The heart races so it can pump blood to your big muscles so that you can run or you can fight. You can explain that to the kids. If they're feeling dizzy, that's happening because when all the blood is going to the big muscles, it's not so much to the head, and you're going to feel and you're going to feel dizzy. Um, you might be really sweaty. All that activity is increasing your body temperature. Also, in um, prehistoric times, if you were sweaty and slippery, you were harder to catch. So it was like a uh, adaptive mechanism. Um, uh, what else? Oh, and the and the out of breath. So the um, the shallow breathing. <laughs> That's, you know, it gets a lot of oxygen in quickly, but it, which is good for those muscles, but bad for the head. So the, the combination of the head and, the, and the, um, the shallow breathing that they feel like they can't get control of and their heart pounding in their chest and feeling all sweaty and hot, that's, that's pretty terrifying to a kid. But I think if you, if you can help explain to them where that came from, and the other thing important to explain to them is that it never goes on forever, right? Nobody ever really died from a panic attack, right? Eventually, it stops. Even if you've, you hyperventilate so much that you pass out, as soon as you pass out, your body takes over and you breathe and you're fine. <laughs> so it's, it's really, it's always important to educate them that this is why this happens, because in history, your body, bodies needed this. You're, you know, we don't really need it anymore, but it happens sometimes anyway. But there, um, th so those feelings will eventually pass, but what also can happen is when, when kids have periodic anxiety bouts, after a while, their baseline is raised. Do you know what I mean by that? So like, if you think about you're having kind of a bad morning, you go to get in the shower and someone uses a bowl of hot water, and then you're out of milk and you can't put it in your coffee, and then you're driving and you miss the exit, and then you get to work and you realize that you forgot your lunch, and now you just lose it. You lose it. Now, normally, if you just lost your lunch, you'd be okay, right? But your, your, your bucket has been getting filled, and now it's, and now it's over the top. So with these with anxious kids, if we think of anxiety on a scale of one to 10, right? You wake up in the morning and you know, most people are in a, in a pretty good space, right? You're down there in the low numbers, zero, one, two. After a while, the anxious kids tend to be waking up at a five, right? So they're ready. 
you know, <laughs> they're ready for something bad to happen. And and they so they they, get, they you know they get into school and they their locker is stuck and they cry and you're like what, um, <laughs> right? But it's because they're already primed. So it's important to learn how to keep to keep your baseline low. And that's where some of the relaxation um, techniques come in. Um, and this is, this is a really interesting thing to, to hang on to, which I, I think is pretty fascinating. Have you ever heard of the vagus nerve? All right, so the vagus nerve goes from, it's a big, long, complicated nerve. It starts in the lower part of your brain, and it goes through your whole core, and it has little branches. And your vagus nerve is really important in all those body functions. And, um, and stimulating the vagus nerve can stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system is the amygdala one that gets everything revved up and out of control, okay? The parasympathetic nervous system is the opposite. That's what helps you get calm, okay? So fight or flight, and parasympathetic is rest and digest, okay? So stimulating the vagus nerve is really important. And there are various ways of doing this, but the most common way is from the breath. So who's heard about breathing when you're anxious, right? Take a deep breath, right? And you know, it's easy to think, oh, yeah, well, sure. But the reality is that if you do deep breathing properly, it absolutely stimulates your vagus nerve and it absolutely lowers your heart rate, lowers your blood pressure. It's like magic. And the thing about it is that it's not taking one deep breath, okay? It's literally being able to take slow, diaphragmatic breaths from your belly, which we never do. We always are, we're always trained to like hold our belly in, right? Right, but, but what you wanna do is you wanna breathe so that you are extending your belly. The air is going preferably in through your nose and out through your mouth. A really good rate of breathing is only six breaths a minute. Five seconds in, five seconds out. If you can do that on a regular basis, you're good, okay? But when you are in a bad spot, what you wanna be able to do is really slow your breath down and have your, um, the, your when, when you take the breath in, be shorter than when you're exhaling, okay? so. For instance, um, and you can, it takes a little bit of training. Like, you want to get to the point where you can do 7 11 breathing. Slow, I know, it's not like she made her roll her eyes at me. <laughs> it sounds really hard, but you, you, know, you want to start with maybe we call it with the kids five finger breathing, okay? You, you breathe in through your nose and out really slow. In, you do it with them, in through your nose and out through your mouth. You want to do that for several minutes, right? And that's going to help um, calm their nervous system. But they have to do it while they're learning how to breathe in their belly. So they have to be looking at their belly, you know, laying down and, and you know, feel, feel their hand go up. Or um, you can look in a mirror and they can watch their belly. But it's, it's a very different kind of feeling because you, you don't do it very often. But I don't want to make you do it now because it's kind of embarrassing. But um, it's, it's, really worth, it's really worth trying. Um, so part of, the, part of the key, though, for really calming your system down is to have your exhale be longer than your inhale. So you can start off with you know, four seconds in, six seconds out, but you really want to get it to be very slow. And you can even think about it as three-part breathing, like first breathing in, filling in your belly, then your chest, then your upper chest, and then out in the other direction. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of handouts on that, too. But another way to do it, too, is if you, if you lie a kid on their belly, like right on their belly, what happens is that because of your, of your chest um, and the rib cage, and you breathe in, you actually, it's, you're automatic, they're automatically doing belly breathing. The air automatically gets pushed down to the belly. So that's an easy way if they're having trouble getting the, getting the belly part in there. That's an, an automatic way to do it. Um, so this is why all the yoga people are like also calm because they're, they're doing that all the time. Um, and I have to say personally, like I never believed in any of that stuff, but I have to say that I thought it's, it's pretty effective. I mean, you always feel better after yoga class. Um, so that, so the breathing is tremendously important for the, um, for the stimulating the vagus nerve. There are other ways to do it, like if, if you go home and you Google vagus nerve stimulation, it's, it's, it's amazing how much research there is on this. So, you know, you can even just like splash cold water on your face can be helpful. Um, 
the whole, you know how the Swedish people go out in the cold and they jump in the thing and they go, right? <laughs> there's, there's a lot of different, um, different ways of, of doing this. So it all helps you relax. Um, let's see. Oh, and you can also, um, another thing to practice with, um, with kids is uh, progressive muscle relaxation. Have you heard of that? It's been around forever, like since the 70s. <laughs> um, but progressive re relaxation, muscle relaxation comes from the notion that to really relax a muscle, you have to kind of locate it and tense it first. So, um, and I, I do have, a, it's part of the handout too that you can do with, with your kids. Um, in that you, what you do is you, you tighten the muscle first, hold it for like, you know, five or 10 seconds, and then let it relax and then do it again. And it's called progressive because you move through the different muscles of the body. And um, it's another thing, another thing you could Google or find on YouTube. Because uh, there, there are ways of doing it that break the muscles, the muscle um, areas of the body into really small discrete areas. It can take 45 minutes to do, do, do a PMR. Or like the exercise sheet that I get, left you is maybe 10 minutes. Um, it kind of does your hands and then you, you tighten, squeeze this and relax it. And, squeeze this and relax it. Um, and it, the child is focused for 10 whole minutes on tensing and relaxing. They don't want to think about anything else. And it's a very good way to get the body back down to baseline. And the other thing to do is uh, good old fashioned getting them moving. You know, I, we, we talk about why there's more anxiety in kids than there used to be. And certainly there's more trauma in the world, I think, the social media and kids are aware of more than they should be aware of and that increased anxiety but kids aren't moving enough kids aren't um, when you when you have adrenaline in your body that f feeds a sense of agitation and when you exercise physically you're burning off that adrenaline and uh, that is a natural way of also releasing endorphins which make you feel better and more relaxed so you know if every kid could get outside and and work up a sweat, <laughs> they would be in much better shape. So if you have a kid who has a, you know, they wake up in the morning and they're starting off not at a good baseline, you know, maybe even if you had, you know, someone took them outside for 10 minutes and to shoot hoops, or they run with the dog around the block three times. I mean, getting, getting your system going is really good for burning off the adrenaline and increasing the endorphins. And certainly doing that, um, certainly doing it after school is good as well. Same thing with you know the video games are just terrible. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I just think that they create anxiety. They're playing these things that are they're um, they're competitive and they're tense. Um, and sometimes there's nasty talk going on 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 when they're playing those live video games. So I think that uh, it's they're they're not they're not good if you're yes. Yeah, don't ask me. I don't cut gym. <laughs> no, you know why? Because the, the board of education, I mean, the Department of Education, in the state is all about time on learning. I mean, it's the standards. I mean, we, you know, we ask kids in fifth grade to do algebra now. Don't get me started. Um, uh, no, no. I mean, the, really, these there are these the the state board of education comes out with these uh, guidelines for how many minutes a day you have to have of instruction and all the things that have to be covered. And when, you know, it's, it's, frankly, it's not realistic. But there is studies that show that kids do this. It's there, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's all kinds of studies, like there's a beautiful program called Mind Up. Have you ever heard of that? So Mind Up is a mindful, you know, mindfulness is the whole, the notion of paying attention to your mind and being in the present and, you know, taking care of your body and doing, you know, doing breathing um, and understanding stress management. And um, Mind Up is a program that was developed by um, actually Goldie Hawn's foundation. So it's a program, a curriculum for, um, for school age kids that involves you know, mindful exercises during the day. And there was this crazy data that when, when, when a school would adapt this, and honestly, it's like really hard to adapt because it's like it works if you're in a great little private school and you have you know, 12 kids in a class. But when, when they, put this into place, academic scores went up. Not just decreasing, you know, symptoms of anxiety. Kids performed better.
because they were in a better mental state. Yeah. I, was, I mean, I, yeah, absolutely. I'm with you. <laughs> you know, I, when I first started working in Challenge for Purdue, fifth graders had recess twice a day. You know. We just talk an awful lot about video games and all these other outside resources which are agree does contribute, but mm -hmm. it's also yeah, no. But uh, parents have taken them away, too. You know, I mean, I think that um, I, th I, th I feel like we've moved to a place where some people are afraid to make their child upset. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll hear a story, well, you know, he's, he's online in the middle of the night with his friends. I'm like, well, turn off the Wi-Fi. You know, uh, I don't, you know, there are things that we can do. We, and we, we have to be, I, mean, I, I don't know about you guys, but some of you are way younger than me, but like, my parents weren't afraid to make me mad. You know, um, <laughs> you know it's just, so I think that there are things that, you know, we, we do to ourselves in some ways too. Um, but I think that that is really, but getting kids physically active is really good for them. Um, and, and not always rescuing them. You know, I think you want to you build in baby steps so that if, you, if, you have, if your child is, you know, this is in front of them and they don't know what to do with it, don't just take it away. You know, find a way to approach it. Um, and that's, and that can, it, it's harder, it's much harder <laughs> in some ways, but if it means that, well, you know, maybe you go to the sleepover for the first hour, you just play with the friends and then this time I'll get you. And this time you're invited to the sleepover, you know, you'll, you'll stay, um, but you'll know that uh, daddy and I are home and my phone is on. You, know, you build in baby steps. Don't just take away the thing. That we have kids who, who don't stay in the school. It's one thing if you're on the spectrum, but we have some kids who don't stay in our school when there's a fire drill because their parents are afraid they're gonna be afraid. Um, and if you have, you know, if you have a, an autistic child who's going to really but a, a normal kid with some anxiety, it's good to teach them about the fire drill. Maybe we start with letting them know when it's going to happen so they can anticipate it. But I don't think you should pick your kid up and take them home for 15 minutes because there's gonna be a fire drill. And I think that, um, I think we need to build in baby steps to get them to cope better with things that are hard for them. Um, even if I'm thinking about myself, you know, like I, last year, I, as a grown up, I took part in a, um, a tap dance class and I had to dance in a recital on a stage <laughs> at the age of 58 and I was pretty nervous you know and I was like well, maybe I won't be in the recital and then I thought you know I did my own little wise mind thing on myself it was like you know people are going to think it's pretty cool but it's a middle-aged laser dancing and they're probably not even going to notice if I mess up and they're just going to be happy that and I'm going to feel proud that I did it so I'm going to do it you know, and it was, but it took me walking myself through my baby steps because my first reaction was like, <laughs> well, even tonight, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, even tonight, like they were going to do this talk and they said, do you mind if we film it? And I was like, yes, I mind if you film it. Um, and then I thought, no, who really cares? You know, it's, so I just took a baby. You had a question, sorry. Yeah, um, so often when um, a child's amygdala is on fire, um, there's really not much you can do in that moment. Right. Um, you know, uh, you kind of have to wait for the storm to blow past. Yes. Um, and so, been there, figured that out. Um, but it seems like when we try to prep our child in calm moments, uh -huh. it's a trigger. When we purposely don't prep our child, it's, it's a, a disaster. <laughs> and, uh, right. And not that I expect an, an answer here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, is. Is one better than another, or, you know? Well, you know, here's the thing. If you think about it, I'm not, I'm not sure what kind of situation you're talking about, but um, one thing that can be good is for a kid to survive and know that, oh, the world didn't come to end. That was really unpleasant for me. I was really upset, and I screamed, and I cried, but I got through it. So, like, a follow-up like that. <laughs> you know? It's like, okay, you, yeah, that was really uncomfortable for you. But look at look what you did. You didn't, you, we didn't, you know, if, like for instance, if you had a kid somewhere and they're having a, you know, uh, let's say they are at a sleepover and you get a panic phone call or they walk into a birthday party, oh, and it's a live animal birthday party and they didn't know that, right? And they want to just run for the hills. Much better to like take them in the bathroom, work through the storm and then take them out. Because that way they didn't have the experience of having to run out when they were still. Because what they're going to remember is being in this heightened anxious state 
and having to leave. Better could keep them somewhere in a back room, calm, and say, okay, now we have a choice. You can go back to the party, we can go home. If they want to go home, that's fine, you know, I think. Um, but there really is, you know, I think, as I said, no one died from a panic attack, and if your guy's not gonna hurt themselves, one thing that we see, like, you know, kids who sometimes have, a, you know, an issue coming to school, like, really bad, <laughs> you know, really don't want to be there, screaming, throwing up in the car. What we used to tell parents is, you know what, bring us a clean set of clothes, we'll clean them up, and they can stay in their office as long as they need to, but they'll, go, they'll see that, you know what, I, I did it, I did it. I was really mad, I kicked and screamed, I barfed in the wastebasket, but nothing bad happened. I mean, you know, that's not the end of the world. I was okay. Um, I had a kid not too long ago who had, a, you know, had a tough history and had changed schools and had a family change that was dramatic and didn't want to be in our school. And it was like the first, the first couple of days I thought, oh my God, no way is this, you know, whatever, forget it. This is never going to work. But after, for him, after seeing for three, four, five days that, you know what, we're going to sit with you, we're going we're gonna to remain calm, you don't have to go to class, you're just going to stay in the building. Uh, and then eventually, over the course of three or four weeks, the kid got to class. And that was one of the worst things I ever saw. Like, I really thought that was not going to work. Because <laughs> he was, like you're talking about, having major meltdowns. Um, but I think it's, it's good for a kid to see that they can survive it. it. Like you, you know, like maybe you go river rafting and you're scared and you fall out of the boat and it was horrible, but you can be proud of yourself in the end that you did it, right? You know, you didn't drown and you're there to, to tell the story. Well, that's good. Um, you know, and if you do these kind of things to your kids and with your kids and, you know, you feel like you're not making much headway, then it's probably time to get some professional help um, you, know, you can start with your pediatrician, um, look for a, uh, um, a therapist who specializes in anxiety in kids, and, and occasionally a kid needs some medication. You know, there are some kids for whom seem to have a very strong genetic component, a very strong biological component, and you try all of the, you know, the cognitive behavioral approaches that we were talking about, and, you know, and a therapist working with the family, and they just need something to get their neurotransmitters back a little more in balance, and that happens sometimes. Um, and it's, you know, it's not the end of the world. It's, it's, no, no one likes to put a kid on medication, but if it means your kid can take part in a sport, going to parties, um, going to a friend's house after school and they wouldn't do it before, then, you know, I, th I, think, it's, I think it's worth it, so. Um, I did have, um, any more questions? Yeah. Um, do you bring that child to the doctor? Like, how do you know? Oh, well, you know, sometimes it is a, it definitely can be a, a process of elimination, you know. So um, if your kid is talking about being worried, then, you know, good chance it is related to the worry. Um, but if you're not sure, there's nothing wrong with bringing it to the doctor. You know, we always say it's, it's also good for the kid to hear. You know what? We took you to the doctor. We did these tests. Everything is fine in your belly, and we really think that your, your worry brain is making your belly sick. And I think it's also really important that um, you don't ever let a, a kid think you don't believe them. Okay, because there, there are, you know, there, sometimes kids will fake something, but these kids are genuinely sick. I mean, their mind is making them sick. <laughs> it's not like they're not having a stomach ache or not having a headache. Um, so you, you know, I, you need to let them know that I understand that you are, ha you know, you, you feel sick. I believe you feel sick. I just think that, the grown-ups, we've done all the tests we can do, and we really think that it's your worry brain that's making your body sick, because your, your mind can make your body feel sick sometimes. So don't make them feel like you don't believe them. Um, that's a, that's a, it's a, it's a, tough, a tough thing with kids. It can be expensive. <laughs> um, but we've had, definitely had kids who've been through upper GI, lower GI. It's like, yeah, there's nothing wrong. You know, this is, this is, a, this is a case of anxiety. What if it's just the opposite? When you think that your child has some anxiety issue, but the child says, no, uh, everything is fine. <laughs> and uses everything that you tell them. Oh, you mean like they won't go to therapy and they yes. won't? 
Yeah. Or, or even to get um, to see if they have it, or they're completely just opposite. Well, they won't even see if they have it. You mean like they won't take part in evaluation? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, you know, for starters, there are a lot of things that like a, a therapist will be, or a psychologist, or a psychiatrist will be able to diagnose diagnose based on like parent report and teacher report and meeting the kid. The, the kids have to acknowledge it. You know, they could, you know, like I said before, there's some kids who say, you know, I don't, I don't need to go to parties. I don't need to play in the bands. I don't need, I'm fine. I'm all myself in my room. I'm fine. No, they're not fine. That, right? That's not a normal way for a kid to live. So, so the so the doctor, if you go to see a, you know, a mental health professional, you can certainly give them all the history and what you see every day and they'll be able to make a diagnosis without the kid acknowledging it. The problem is what they're going to do with it because if the kid doesn't want to change, it's not, you know, nobody changes until they want to change. So um, until there's something that that kid wants to do that they can't do because of their anxiety, you could be in a tough spot, unfortunately. Do you have any recommended literature? Yes. Um, there's, I made a little list. I can find it. Um, there's a, a nice, for kids, there's a nice book called Stress-Free Kids, and another one called Freeing Your Child from Anxiety. Those are good for parents. Um, for teenagers, I think it's good to like, hmm? Oh, sorry, the question was, oh, Freeing Your Child from Anxiety. And another one is called Stress-Free Kids. Those are two good books for, you know, basically childhood age. Um, I think it's good with the, now the one, freeing your child from anxiety, that's very appropriate to learn about anxiety in adolescence as well. Um, it's kind of crosses the age spans. But there's a nice book called My Anxious Mind, which is meant for a kid to read, for a teenager to read. And, um, and sometimes when, you know, you can just sort of like leave something lying around and <laughs> see if they pick it up, things work better. <laughs> you know? so, that's always good. Um, or even if, it, if it, even if you bought it and gave it to the school counselor and said, hey, if, if he likes the school counselor, you know, you want to want to hand this up, so let, say, tell him you let him borrow it, um, that, that could work too. Um, so those, those are helpful. Um, and I do find that the, um, if you have a kid who is interested in more of the mindfulness stuff, um, there is a, uh, an organization called Little Flower Yoga. And they do all kinds of stuff for, um, they run programs in schools and whatnot, but they also have um, books for parents about things, activities you can do with your kid that are um, you know, stress reducing. Um, and then, you know, and that's another thing, just, there are a lot of kids who are anxious because they have too much going on. You know, I mean, we have, I think that there's so much stuff available to kids and I think we always, that old FOMO thing, you know, we're always afraid our kids will be missing out on something, so we sign them up for, for everything, and um, I may have been a little guilty of that. Um, <laughs> I think it's, I think it's, uh, it's hard. You know, I remember being a kid and having downtime, like, you know, taking dance class on Tuesday and Thursday and this, thing, and then having days that I just kind of did my homework and went outside, and I think kids have very little of that now, um, and I don't know about you, but I need downtime with nothing to do. And if I just want to read a magazine or sit outside and sip iced tea and, you know, look at the garden. And I think that kids don't have enough, enough downtime. Um, I do think we have too high a homework load. But once again, you know, I'm preaching to the choir. Um, you know, starting in like seventh grade, it's, 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 it's high. Um, and I think that some kids can handle it and some kids can't. Uh, and I think there's nothing wrong with your kids in high school. You know, maybe your kid's recommended for four honors courses, but you say, you know what, two's enough. I think there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, if, if something's going to make your kid miserable for four years, better that they take two courses that they can handle and still have some free time. Um, because you only get to be a kid once. And that really makes me sad sometimes when I think about, you know, you have your whole life to work, right? <laughs> um, and I, I, you know, I think, it's, I think it's nice for kids to have a little more downtime to just do a lim more limited activities. <coughs> Sometime you just get in the car and go to the beach, <laughs> you know, um, and not have everything be structured and competitive. And uh, so I think it's, it's 
good to talk with your kids about that too. Even, even if you have a kid, once again, even if you have a kid who is, I want to play a varsity sport, you know, every 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 term, and I'm going to take all these classes, and I'm going to work in the play, and and you may have to, as a parent, say, yeah, no, you know, you can pick this or this, but you can't do all that because you're not you're not, you're going to bed at 12 o'clock. And that's something that's bad for kids' anxiety, too. We have a lot of kids not getting enough sleep. We have kids in fifth grade get it, going to bed at 10 o'clock because they have hockey practice. Um, so we have kids not getting enough rest. You know, and they ask me a pediatrician, and they should be getting nine, 10 hours of sleep. And you know, a lot of them, that's not happening. So, um, so that's a concern. So you know, e eating healthy, of course, and getting some exercise, and getting some sleep. Yeah. How, she's four? Four. And I turn on the front like in the moment, she's yep. freaking out, and then the dog's gone. It's not a dog. Yeah. And Has so she I had a bad experience with dogs? Yeah, they jumped on her little. Oh. So I'm trying to keep bringing her up to friendly dogs on leashes, but it's like. Well, I think that's the best you can do because, because you know, she will. How old is she now? We said four? Oh. She's little. So I think. Um, I think if you continue to be calm around the dogs too, that's a really important thing. Like if you're if you're nervous, then forget it. Okay, so it's like, oh, we're gonna go for a walk. We might see some dogs. You know, dogs are. You're, you're with me. You're safe. I'm going to make sure the dogs I see are on a leash and and do that. You know, if you see a dog loose up there, say, hey, put your dog on a leash. You know, there's no that's that's fine for you to protect your kid that way. Um, and I think that the more she has expo exposure to being safe around the dog, she'll be fine. Also. If you can, um, you don't have a dog, right? Yeah. So, like, if you can get her some experience with like little puppies, where she's bigger than the puppy, and she can start to feel safe, and then, you know, like, it, I don't know, if you can go visit a shelters or what? What? Oh, I forgot about that. Is that why they got a dog? Yeah, they got a dog. Oh. They got a dog, so they got a dog that was this big, and then she watched the dog grow, and then she was fine with dogs. Okay, I didn't know that story, but <laughs> um, yeah, that's a problem. Get a dog. No, don't get a dog. <laughs> um, but I think that's, that's, you know, I think that's what you can do, and you know, um, yeah. All right. Any other questions? Yep. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'll get you next. I promise. Are there foods that um, are, uh, will flare up the, uh, the sympathetic nervous system? Well, all quickly? those, like, yeah, I mean, you want to watch those things that have caffeine in them, obviously, and too much sugar, because that's, you know, those are things that make you feel a little uneven. I think as long, I mean, it's not, you can have a little treat every now and then, but you definitely, um, caffeine is not good for kids. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, like yeah. going on the plane and going. No, not even that. Like you'd be like, well, that sounds great, but can we go next week instead? Like you'll want to like rationalize it. Oh. Because yeah, we're going to Disney. This is fantastic. No, I, I think but you. Every little change. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think with something like that, you're obviously going to be able to talk about it far in advance. You're going to talk to other kids who've been to Disney World, talk about all the positive things that will happen in Disney World, talk about what it might be that makes you nervous about going to Disney World, to find out what's, what's in his mind. Um, with other things that are going on, sometimes you don't want to give kids too much lead time. Like if you have a kid who you know has to have their tonsils out in four months, you don't have to tell them four months in advance. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, that, that's okay. You want to give them a little warning, but you don't, they don't need to have all that, that much time to, to build up anxiety about it. Um, but I think that in general, the, be the best you can do is just to educate them about it and to tell them what's going to be happening and, and how you're getting there and what to expect. Show them videos, get them excited. Um, you know, we have new schools are hard, um, but the vast majority get through it. You know, um, one thing like if you, if you if you could change your school and they're nervous about going up to fifth grade. You know, arrange to get a visit in June, a private visit. Like I've done that with kids from fourth grade. They'll come up, just visit with their mom, just visit me. They get a private tour around the school, meet their guidance counselor, meet the teacher. 
and they come back once they get their schedule in August, and they can walk around, find all their, because kids that work back getting lost, but they can walk around in August. You know, if you have an issue like that with a kid, the office will be accommodating. They don't like to advertise that, but they will be. Um, you can come and, um, you know, and visit the school. Things like that are, are helpful for kids. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, with transitions, a lot of autistic kids have trouble with transitions. So if you look up social stories for different events, mm -hmm. there's a ton of stuff online now that will walk the kids through it. Because a lot of them have been created for autistic kids, so it really depends kind of where. Yeah. But you can find ones for different ages and different scenarios and different. Um, and some of the schools have those. But, yeah, the um, speech and language pathologists like yeah. who work with kids with you know special needs. They create social stories, meaning it's just sort of like telling the story over and over again what's going to happen. So it becomes second nature by the time they have to do it. We're going to get on a plane here, we're going to go here, and we're going to have a van, and we're going to do this, and then, you know, and after a while it becomes a story they know, and it's no longer, um, no longer new. All right. Well, thank you for coming tonight. Take care, and good luck.